Both our pastors are out. They're at men's advance. Um, a lot of our men are out. They're at men's advance. But we're glad you're here today to worship the Lord uh, with us today and to hopefully learn from me. So uh, you're kind of stuck with the junior varsity here today. So, uh, But I, I went over the sermon stuff with both Pastor Marks, and uh, they helped me out quite a bit through this. And I'll be referring to a book uh, on tape that... Uh, it was on a disc that my wife Kelly got for me called Same Kind of Different as Me. I don't, know if, I don't know if any of you have heard of that book. Great book. I'm not much of a reader, and Kelly knows that, so she gets books on CD for me so I can listen to when I drive back and forth to Kemmer. Uh, so that's what I do with my time. Uh, and we will, let's see, we're about 11.15. We're going to try to have you out here before 2.30 today. <laughs> a joke, Paul. <laughs> so I would like to start um, uh, this morning with the reading of the word, but before we read the word, uh, let's pray and uh, pray with me. Heavenly Father, I just uh, come to you today and uh, ask that you be preeminent in this service, Lord, that your spirit would move amongst us, that we'd uh, be hearers of your word and doers of your word and um, um, listen and gain. Lord, I ask that you'd speak uh, your words here through me and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we'll be reading, <coughs> excuse me, we'll be reading from Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 through the end of the chapter. And um, I'll read from the New King James Version here. So follow along if you can there, please. Um, Verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the lust of the flesh, uh, for the flesh lust against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And And they are contrary to one another. And so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand... Just as I told you in the past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who are in Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Here ends the reading. It's for you Lutherans. I came out of the Lutheran church years ago, and that, that's for probably some of you came out of it too somewhere. I don't know, but that's what we used to say after the reading of the word. Um, so some things you can never quite shake. So... Let's start with verse 16. I just want to give you a blow-by-blow. I don't want to do a big introduction here, but um, the goal of the Christian life is to uh, walk in the Spirit. Uh, That is the Spirit-filled life, and it seems like it would be easy. Um, Seems like it would be just as after you receive Christ, you receive him in his fullness, and everything's grand and glorious, and it would be just as simple as that. Because the Christian life is not about life after death, but it's about life after birth. So we are to live this life here on earth with vigor, with perseverance, with discipline, with Uh, love with basically everything we've got. But here's the problem. Um, When we come to Christ, 
into that relationship when we start it, we bring baggage with us. And we're going to call that baggage the flesh. That enters into that relationship just as, as uh, the new life, the new birth has entered in there. So um, in Christianity, there is a thing in America called Christianese. And I just want to uh, define what I feel the flesh really is. And to me, what it is is the flesh is our thoughts, our actions, and our lifestyles outside of Jesus' control. That's what it, the flesh really is. And when I look at myself and I think of my thoughts, my actions, and my lifestyles, I'm almost embarrassed to be up here because you can look right here down in verse 22 and see what's going on up here. Now, um, the things are not good in the flesh. They, they are contrary to God. They're contrary to his spirit. And so, if both of those things are entered into that relationship, are entered in, there's a war going on. There is warfare out there. And in Ephesians, it tells us that bat- we battle not against flesh and blood, but against forces and powers. But this battle just takes place in our own mind. It's not a battle for the soul. It's a battle for the mind and, and control of that. And how. And once the battle for the mind takes place, um, the thoughts and actions just roll right off of that. So um, we need to be prepared. The flesh is against the spirit. And now for you people new to Wyoming, the Carstensons are new to Wyoming. In Wyoming, we say it's again the spirit. The flesh is again the spirit. (laughs) And the spirit again the flesh. So, so but the flesh, those thoughts, those actions, those lifestyles outside of the control of Jesus, they will drag you down. They will hold you captive. You'll live a life full of guilt. And there's no way out. Or so it would seem at that point. But the spirit, and I like this. Everybody, if you looked at the spirit, right where it says spirit right there. But the spirit, if you look at it, it's capitalized, which means it's got power. It's got authority. It's got everything we need to overcome the flesh here. So is there to convict? The spirit is there to convince. The spirit is there to produce dynamic lifestyle, which we call fruit. Um, That's available for every Christian sitting here, the fruit of the spirit. So it seems easy, right? Or you say, how hard can this be? Or you might say, you know, I'll work on that later on down the road. That's nonsense. To work on that later on down the road is, is, is not good. What you need to do is understand the flesh and understand it now. The time to work on it is not tomorrow. That's my, my tendency. Any job can be done tomorrow. The time to work on it is right now. Now, I'm not <clears throat> much of a football player or a football fan, as a matter of fact, but I do like one player. And I'll tell you why I like this guy here. I like Peyton Manning. And the reason why I like this guy is the guy is smart. And when Peyton Manning goes to the ball, you can see that he understands every offensive play in his book better than anyone on his team. He controls the whole team, and the team does what he says. But you know what else he's in control of? Those on the other side. He knows the defense better than the defense knows the defense. And that's what makes him special. It's not his arm strength. It's just how he approaches the game. And they say he studies for hours upon hours after a game, before a game, and and through the week. It's just study time. But he's got to understand the defense. So when we come up against the flesh, we ought to, as Christians, to understand what the flesh really is, okay, Uh, and what it can do. And how, uh, how evident it is, as the word says. So, um, when I think about the flesh, too, and when I think about this new life here, 
I kind of shake and shudder at times. But I take a little bit of comfort in this. If we were to turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 7... starting with verse 15 to the end of the chapter. This is the Apostle Paul, and there's no reason to believe that the Apostle Paul hadn't been birthed in his Christianity at this time, and this is what was happening in his his walk. It says, For what I am doing, I do not understand. For For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate to do, that I do. If then I do what I will not do, will not to do, I agree that the law is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that's what I practice. Now if what I do, now if I do what I will not to do, this is kind of tongue twister here for me here, so. It is no longer I who do it, but the sin that, the sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that is, that evil is present with, with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, So then with my mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. See, there's two things present in Paul's life. It was the law of God, or the the law of the Spirit, which brings freedom, and the law of sin and death, which Steve read about here in Romans chapter 8 there. So um, the flesh is powerful. Let's not make any mistake there. The flesh is powerful. Our thoughts and deeds are controlling outside the control of Jesus. They control us. But the spirit changes lives and is more powerful. It absolutely is essential for you and I and for our own lives um, uh, to live this spirit-filled, dynamic Christian life that God intends us to live. Um, it's also impressive for those on looking when they see the spirit-filled life lived out amongst Christian believers or those who call themselves Christians. So in verse 18, I'd like to look at that. In the spirit, I wrote down, in the spirit there is freedom. When the spirit of God controls you, your thoughts your actions, and your lifestyles. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no law there. There is, we are free, and when the Lord sets you free, you're free indeed. So it makes no sense for us to live any other way than that, to live life in the Spirit. Now, our tendencies... Uh, and I think this is a generality, but our tendencies is to live life perched atop a fence. We have these two natures going, right? And I've used this illustration in youth group before. And what what my tendency is to do is to ride this fence, and I know the good, the spirit-filled life, but I also know where my my flesh would take me to on the other side of this fence. But people feel there is safety on top of that fence. We get a little bit of one, we get a little bit of the other, and there's safety atop that fence. Until you read verses like Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. If you look at that verse, in that verse it says, 
He who is not with me is against me. That's shuddering to me. Um, so, um, it makes no sense to live life any other way than in this spirit that's available for, for each one of us in here. So, the spirit-filled life, or the fruits of the spirit, can and they are seen by Christians. They are seen by non-Christians. And they're seen by God. They're, see, they're evident um, for all. So is the flesh. The flesh is seen by those two. So we really have to be careful. It's, it's essential that we're really careful on how we live. Because, for example, if we live the flesh-filled life, people from the outside look in and say, I don't want any part of that. They are no different than anyone else. They call themselves a Christian, but it's only by name. And the reason why I don't go to church, you know why I don't go to church? Because there's hypocrites in here. They say one thing and do another. Okay? So the spirit-filled life is the only way to go. The, the flesh is under the law. And if you're under the law, what the flesh gets you is it'll result in a guilty verdict. It'll result in um, conviction. It'll result in absolutely no freedom. It'll result in, <clears throat> as the word says, it'll result in eternal separation. The flesh, that's where it'll get you. Put your life back in the control of Jesus. Um, the work of the flesh again, is our thoughts, our actions, our lifestyles without Jesus having control. That's in verse 20. Uh, I, I believe it's in verse 19. The works of the flesh, there's another point here that we really need to nail home here. The works of the flesh are evident. Everyone's looking. Even when you think they're not looking, they're looking. And, and the reason why, um, to be honest with you, the reason why all these seats aren't filled up, do you know why? We try to mix this work of the flesh into our Christian living, and it doesn't work. It's no good. Okay? We're going to talk about that a little bit later here, because the work of the Spirit will produce one problem, maybe two or three. But I'll, I'll tell you what that is in, in verse 25 or 26 here. But... Um, the work of the flesh is what we do naturally and years ago and I refer to uh, this evangelist John Dyer just about every time I'm up here because I don't remember a lot anymore <laughs> especially after about five minutes I don't remember a lot but I remember what John Dyer said he said this and it stuck with me maybe it'll stick with you too he said so a thought Reap an action. Reap an action. Develop a habit. Develop a habit. Create a lifestyle. It goes like that. These works of the flesh, if you look at them, the deeds of the flesh that are listed up here are nothing more than thoughts and actions outside of the control of Jesus. That's what they are. Okay? Um, <clears throat> We don't want anyone in here to live a life filled with deception, a life filled with um, <coughs> conviction, a life filled with guilt. We want everyone to be free. Um, so, now, if we see these thoughts, these actions, these lifestyles outside of the control of Jesus, I just want to caution us to not be alarmed, and when you see him, not give the audible gasp, <gasps> Did you see what he just did? Expect it. Expect it. It's listed right here. It's, it, this is what people do naturally. And, and this is outside of the control. This is where they'll gravitate to. Okay? So um, we shouldn't be uh, super prudent about this. We should just expect that's what it is. That's, that's what it is. I'm not saying it's good. It isn't. It's, it's bad. It's really bad. It's it's consuming, it's controlling, and it'll, 
it'll tear your life up. So, um, um, these works of the flesh, too, one other thing. If you're practicing these works of the flesh right now, I want you to think about it in this, in this respect. Would you use one of these words on a resume? Well, I'm, I'm envious. I'm jealous. Fornicator. and uh, It just ain't going to go anywhere. It's not going to go anywhere. So if we don't use them on a resume for a boss, why would we use them in God's kingdom? We can't. We absolutely can't. So if this is a struggle... In, in anyone's life, in my life, or in anyone out here, if we need the power of God in our lives. It's what we need to break that struggle, okay? And that's the only thing that can break it. All these fruits that are, we're going to study here in just a minute, none of them can be self-produced. Zero, okay? And, and by the way, let's go in there right now. The Spirit has power. Sometimes in my Christianity, I think... And this is bad thinking, bad theology. God is all-powerful. Jesus is just as powerful, and the Holy Spirit is just along for the ride. That's my thinking sometimes. That's wrong. The Spirit was there to create just as God was there to create. He created something out of nothing. That's what he did. And this is what the Spirit is capable of doing in our lives, the Spirit is powerful, all powerful, just like God the Father is. He can take these these deeds of the flesh, which are nothing, and will get you nowhere into something. He can take the selfish ambitions and murders and turn them into love. He can take the outburst of wrath and turn them into joy. He can take dissensions and contentions and turn them into peace. He can take selfishness and jealousy and impatience and turn them into patience. He takes hatreds and murders and turns them into kindness. Uncleanliness and evil and turns them into goodness. He takes heresies and selfishness and unfaithfulness and turns them into faithfulness. He takes uncleanness, lewdness, abruptness, insensitivities and turns them into gentleness out of nothing. He takes revelries and weird-like parties and turns them into self-control. He takes something out of nothing and turns them into what we call fruit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's all of them. The fruit of the Spirit. Notice he doesn't say fruits of the Spirit. Now, the fruit of the Spirit is one. It's one fruit. You have it all or none. Would you want all of it or just one of it so I can work on these other things? The other things can't be self-produced, not in the Spirit. The other things are not self-produced. So um, I don't know if you've ever been to a grocery store and had a case slot sale where you get two for one. Anybody ever done that at the grocery store? You get two for one, and you're thinking, this is awesome. We got, we got two for one. You know how much we saved? This is an incredible deal here, people. This is nine for one. <laughs> There's nine things in here in one that you get with the fruit. And that's there's there's no money that can buy it. There's no... Deeds that you work for to get it, you just receive it. So we really ought to look at how we get this fruit in our lives. <coughs> and the fruit um, comes in our lives by abiding in Christ and letting him have control in our lives, taking up residency right here at home. Um, <coughs> And I'd like to point out a couple of verses in Rome, uh, John chapter 15. Paul, John chapter 15 is right after John 14.
Let's look at John 15, verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branches cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. (coughs) I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. That is probably the biggest secret. Um, I'm not saying it's the only, but that is the biggest secret into having the spirit-filled life. You get closely connected with the vine, and the spirit flows right through that vine to give you that life-filling spirit. Um, Other things that have helped me in the past for living the spirit-filled life is to take every thought captive. Some of these things that come in here, if I think on them too much, smoke starts coming out this year. But they aren't good. Some of the things aren't good. So I have to take that captive and let the spirit work on that, and it dis- dissipates. Kelly asked me yesterday, we were driving to Ogden, and said, how are you doing? I said, I'm mad. She said, why are you mad? So she kind of helped me through that, gave me a few lashings, and I was <laughs> better. So um, the other thing, our thought life is preeminent in this. Uh, It's very important in uh, living the spirit-filled life. So I would like to look at Philippians 4, 8. I remember James Sherman preached a sermon on that years ago, and these are one of the things I remember. If I remember it, it's something exceptional. Um, But... He replaced all these things, think about these things, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is good. If anything is praiseworthy or um, however the verse goes, I'll flip over there. Philippians 4.8. In closing, this is what Paul said. And I'm not closing, by the way. I'm just getting started. <laughs> but... Paul says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, is there any virtue? And if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things or think on these things. Let those things control your heart. And James Sherman twisted that around. He didn't twist it around, but he said in his thought life he said jesus is every one of these things so he read it like this to us he read it in front of the whole congregation uh whatever things are jesus 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 and if anything is jesus or jesus meditate on these things and and that summed it up for me and um um i could remember that and it helped me out a lot in uh, difficulties. So that's what I try to do with my thought life. And that's what we really should do with our thought life is just consume ourselves with that. Now, the spirit, in the spirit, is, um, you know, in the flesh, the things are evident. The acts and the deeds and stuff are evident to all who look on. So is the spirit. And when you see the spirit-filled life, let me tell you, it's attractive. The closer you get to somebody living the spirit-filled life, the more you like that person. The <clears throat> it's uh, contagious. It's intriguing. It's something you remember. It's it's kind of very noticeable. And, and you look on and you basically realize everyone can see this. So... Um, when you see something special, you tend to remember it. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to show you something special. Okay. Now, I uh, moved out here 25 years ago, and I've been somewhat involved in coaching baseball for the last 25 years. Okay. When I, as a baseball coach, and Travi is out here, I coached with him several years. Um, but when we, as a baseball coach, see things that are special, We remember them, and we talk about them, and we marvel over them and say, did you see that? 
that was awesome. And, and uh, so I'm going to show you this morning something special with baseball. Di, are you surprised that I'm not I'm going to baseball here? It's the only thing I know. I don't really know it. but um, So I've asked two young men to come up here to help me out with this demonstration. I'm going to have my son Josh come up here, and I'm going to have Jagger Mitchell come up here. And Jagger, I'm going to have you stand right over here first. Okay, Josh, you're going to come up here on the stage, and uh, I'm going to come back here and show you how special this baseball thing really is so you can remember it because the Spirit and living the fruit out of the Spirit of God is just as special. It's even more special. It's more spectacular than what you're about to see right here. So... I'm going to move this out here just for a second. Josh, I'm going to be the pitcher. <laughs> you're going to be the batter. And you're going to show these people what you do in your routine, your pre-pitch, ready-to-bat preparedness. So, Josh, I want you to get ready and go. Okay? Everyone see that? All right. Got it? That's all we need right now, Josh. Jagger, come up here. Jagger, I'm going to give you this bat. <clears throat> Jagger, I want you to bat like you normally would bat, okay? Everything you do normally so these people can see it. Are you ready? Now, hang on one second. Jagger's always ready, but I'm not ready. We need a plate. So, Jagger, I'm going to be the pitcher. And you get it started here, okay? Are you ready? You ready? Where's the scowl? Don't you have a little scowl on your face, too? <laughs> okay. All right. That's what I want you to see, okay? Now... Jagger, you can go. You guys can go sit down and thank you for the demo. Okay. One of the guys had a little more intensity, and if you ever get the chance to see uh, Jagger in his uh, league games or something like that, do it. Do it. It's something special to see because he tamed it down a lot for you. <laughs> He has a scowl going that'll make a pitcher cry. And he, when he pounds a plate, it's bang. He means business, okay? Likewise, if we mean business in this spirit-filled life, it's noticeable. It's attractive. It's something you'd want to go see. So in the spirit-filled life, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control... If that's what's residing in us, likewise, people are looking on. And if they're looking on, they want to come in here and be a part of it. So living the spirit-filled life, basically, is going to present some problems. And here's the problem. Do we go to two services or three? Because people are looking. Do we enlarge the parking lot or do we start a church building project? Because this will fill the seats. The spirit-filled life is everything we need for evangelism. It gives you an inroad anywhere because people will ask you, what do you got going on in your life? They will ask you. You don't have to go out here and, and preach on the street corner and say, the kingdom of God is near. Kingdom of God. No, they will come. People will come just like in the movie. Uh, so I just really appreciate that. When I saw... Jagger Mitchell bat for the first time, I knew it was special. I told Kelly, I was like, Kelly, you've got to see this. And not only that, he, Jagger goes out and he's got such an intense look on his face with it that he goes out and makes a diving catch, takes him out of the inning, and, and Evanston goes on to win that ball game because of that catch. And Jagger tried to scowl off the diamond after he made that catch, 
And I said, well, I'm not going to let him scowl. I thought, this is just an act, isn't it? So I went up and said, Jagger, do you remember that catch? And every time, every time I see Jagger, I ask him, do you remember that catch? It makes him smile. <laughs> so, so the spirit-filled life is what we need to build God's kingdom here in Evanston, Wyoming. We need everybody to do it. We need you to get off that fence and actually live right here that's in a place that you can reside, you can abide in Jesus, so everyone can come up here and say, whoa, they've got it going on here. They have something that nobody else has, and it's the Spirit, because you cannot produce it by yourself. The Spirit of God, if you go out and say, I'm going to try to work on love, try all you want. It ain't going to work. But the Spirit of God will give you not just love, but it will give you joy, peace, patience, and all the way down the list. That's where we got to have, people. We have to get off our cans and get into the Spirit of God, and then they will come. And it will set you free. You are not under the law if you're in the Spirit of God. There is no law. There is no condemnation. It is freedom. It is joyful living it is peaceful living it's the only place to live it's the only place to reside where you can just sit down in the evening and just visit with your spouse and not have to remember what you said because you told a lie earlier and and it's the best place to be so friends and family i i just urge you the spirit produces that regularly in people And when you see it, this is what it kind of looks like. You encounter somebody who, who you, um, it looks like this. It's so observable that the the closer you get to somebody who's walking in the spirit, the better they look. So um, they never get impressed with themselves. They radiate integrity. They feel you feel like you could trust them with your innermost secrets and innermost problems, and then you find yourself opening up uncharacteristically to these people, and just feel like perfect comfort around them. These are people that are in this spirit-filled life, and um, um, these people in the spirit-filled life. I'm not saying they're perfect, but you know what they do if they know they've messed up or offended somebody, they are quick to go to you and say, I am sorry. I, I've offended you. They're sensitive to the spirit, and they will feel that, and they, they'll just respond and just say, I want to make this right. It's not about me. It's about the spirit of God moving in me. That's what it's about. So the fruit of the spirit is not just one mark of a believer, The fruit of the Spirit is the preeminent mark of the believer in Jesus Christ. So so I urge you, let us walk in the Spirit. Now, if you have the Spirit of God, there's no conceit. There's no, um, as the Word says, um, provoking one another. Boy, that happens at my house. Uh, there's no envying one another. It's just freedom. You're free to enjoy each other. You're free to uh, enjoy God, and you're free to enjoy the kingdom things. You're free to enjoy the eternal security that you have in Jesus. You're free to enjoy all that stuff. But it didn't come from you. So let us not be conceited. Now, uh, I referred to a book that Kelly gave me. It's about a homeless guy in the Dallas, I think it was the Dallas area. And and basically some people went into the mission that he was at and was in the food line and they were feeding him. And they used that as an entry to meet these homeless people because they're people too. People don't think they're people, but they are. Um and anyway, this um, Mr. Ron and 
Miss Debbie in, in Denver is a homeless guy. And Denver goes on to be uh, just an amazing, amazing man of God. And he started off totally against God. Um, and, and anyway, Denver said, in his humility, he said, and this is what I'm going to close. I am going to close now. He said, Denver said, I am a nobody who wants to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. That was Denver's closing. That's who he thought he was, and that's who he lived it up. That's who he was. He was full of the Spirit. And that is available for everyone here. It's available for, for our community. It's available around the world. And, and the Spirit is powerful. And we ought to let, it do its, let him do its work. Thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for um, your word. I want to thank you for your spirit. I want to thank you for all that helped here get your message across, Lord. Father, I pray for your spirit to have preeminence in our lives, Lord. I pray for your spirit to... Uh, be our resting ground, the only place where we will find comfort. And I pray for these fruits to be evident in our lives, just as the flesh is. But I pray for your spirit to light here in this place. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.